she was a girl. Uncovering the unknown. Tracing your family tree or maybe the family tree of a veteran. So this is genealogy for PGL. Genealogy, kind of a long word, bit of a strange spelling to it. What on earth does it mean? Well, you can just say family history instead of genealogy and everybody will understand you. But it's the study of family history and of kinship. Kinship is how people are related to each other by blood, by marriage, or by adoption. I like to think of family history research as being a detective on a treasure hunt all the time. It's a very addictive hobby. And you might find that after doing this assignment. Uh, I'm going to take you through the, the steps in doing family history research. Uh, I'm going to give you some tips. And then I'm going to take you through an exercise at the end um, using a World War I soldier from my family uh, to uh, give you an idea of what kind of documents are out there in, in case you haven't seen these sorts of things before. Before I start, though, the first thing to always reinforce on family history research is start with what you know and move backwards. So when you're doing your own family tree, you start with you. You start with what you know about your own life and your parents and then back to your grandparents and so on. You don't start out by trying to prove that you're related to Lady Gaga or Queen Victoria. I mean, that's you're just going to go down a, a rabbit hole that way. Um, just start with yourself and move backwards. Or in the case of your soldier, start with your soldier and then decide how far backwards you're going to go in his life and then try to go forwards up to his death. Then there are six basic steps, and the sixth one is a cheetah. So first, you collect the information sources you have, and I'll tell you more about each of these. You're going to record the facts, assess the information and sources, make a research plan, do the actual research, and then you start over again, because every time you find something, you end up with a new question, and you have to go and find something else. I wanted to mention, I uh, should have mentioned this earlier, I've left a handout uh, uh, at all the places where I saw a green folder, so if you don't have one, let me know. Um, I might use some words that you haven't seen before. If you see them in the text, which is roughly what I'm, I'm going to be saying, and it's underlined, then if you look to page three, you'll see a definition. One thing I also wanted to mention is that on pages, as I say, when you're, when you're researching your own family history, you want to start with yourself. So ask your parents what they have around the house. Maybe you have a baby book or a family scrapbook. Have you seen your birth certificate? Do you have a pile of family photos that looks like this? No. Everybody does, trust me. Hopefully or somebody has you. written some names on the back of them. Step two is to record the information and the sources of the information. So what I mean by that is, if you've got, say, a birth certificate, Write down the information from the birth certificate, the date of birth, the name of the child, the name of the parents, the location of the birth, and then write down that this came from the birth certificate of Helena Burroughs. Because that way, when you want to, you know, you find some other document that has a different date of birth for Helena Burroughs, and you want to check which one is the most accurate, you can look at what the sources are and think, okay, well, this one was from the school yearbook, and this one was from her birth certificate filled in by her parents immediately after she was born. Well, that might be more accurate. Probably. Uh, probably. Um, I'm going to hand out a few things. Maybe I'll start on each side of the class. So it, there are groups of his first marriage, I knew that he had divorced this woman named Annie. Could you never find a database that would give me a date of the divorce. But one day I was looking on Ancestry and somebody else from Annie Davies' side of the family had a family tree up and they had a divorce date. So I heard that from the lady and I said, 
where did you find it? I've been looking for years. And she said, well, it's right there at the top of the marriage certificate. It stamped, the, the yellow isn't coming through very well, but it stamped divorce granted June 25th, 1931. I had had it in my hands for years and didn't know it was there. So look very closely, even around the margins. You guys remember when we were looking at the attestation paper, right? Where did I say that you found that battalion? Was it in the lines of the document itself, or was it somewhere else? Somewhere else. Yeah, you had, remember, that's what we're talking about. You have to look all over. Sometimes they put it in the strangest places. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that the spelling of surnames, family names, often changes for a lot of reasons. Um, for example, the soldier that Lena is looking at, uh, his surname is Bate, which is a little less common than Bates. I bet she's going to find records somewhere that have his name written as Bates. My last name is Bates. <laughs> Pardon me? My last name is Bates. It, exactly. <laughs> and you could have a cousin named Bates. We, we had friends named Mathesons, and I assumed they were English. I was surprised to find out they're Ukrainian. Uh, but a grandfather had come to Canada with a name like mm, Matuchuk, and he decided <laughs> too complicated. I'm going to call us Mathesons, and they're Mathesons to this day. Now, strangely, living in England. So, names change. Um, sometimes an S falls off of Burroughs. An O falls off of O'Reilly. The Perry family, the Italian Perry family in my hometown, changed their name to Perry with a Y to look English. You'll find a lot of people named Smith that aren't as English as they think they are. There were blacksmiths everywhere. So pretty much every culture has a surname that would translate into English as Smith. And so someone that was Ferraro in Italy might have come into Toronto and become Smith. Someone who was Kovalchuk in the Ukraine may have come and changed his name to Smith here. So think about that. If you can imagine ways that your soldier's name could be misspelled, look that way, and you're, and you're likely to find them. Did anybody see that on uh, Ancestry? When we went to Ancestry.ca last week, when we were looking at the census forms, was there anyone who got a different spelling on the census yeah. forms? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I had Middle way. Yeah. It's, it's an A-R to an E-R. Yeah. And another thing to think about is, 150 years ago, even 100 years ago, people didn't spell as consistently as we do. I mean, you know, I grew up doing spelling drills. This is the only way to spell because. But that wasn't the way that Shakespeare wrote. I'm sure if you looked at his work, you would find several different spellings of a simple word like because. Go ahead. Um, my cousin Miriam. Mm -hmm has an extremely thick book of Shakespeare. I have one of those too. It's a lot of fun. Challenge yourself and try reading it. The sonnets are beautiful and they're short. They're easy to tackle. Uh, another tip I would have when you're writing down information from your sources is to choose a standard date format. You're going to find something written 5, 6, 13. Is that the 5th of June, 1913? Is it May 6th, 2013? Well, you may not be able to figure it out just from the document. So to the best of your knowledge, use the consistent uh, method of writing five, like the, the day, uh, the date in numbers, the month in letters, and then the full four digits of the year. You guys are used to writing the year in four digits, but when I grew up, nobody seemed to realize that the 21st century was coming. And so we just wrote 65, 72, leaving off that 19. It caused all sorts of computer problems. Yes, sir? Uh, wouldn't it just be easier to write the two, num to write the two first numbers, like the, like the date number and then the month number, and then write the whole year? It can work. The thing is that 
between England, Canada, and the United States, we have different orders for the day and the month. So if you have um, an, early, an early day of the month, something that's before 12, you may not be able to, 12, to tell which is the month. If you see a 13, you know that that can't be a month, it's got to be the day. But if it's 5, 6, 2013, do you know which is the month? Is it May or is it June? No. So when you're writing your stuff down, always write it the same way. And in some of your sources, you may have to check other pieces of the puzzle to figure out whether that was, in this example, May or June. Yes, can I help you? Um, well, in Canada, it's more common. Like, most people write it. Um, so say, so for today, they put 10.09 and then 13. So that's what most people do. I think that, that's more of an American way of, uh, of doing it. And then the European way, I think, is month, uh, sorry, no, year, month, and day. Across the world, it varies. So you may have to think about where does this document come from? What's, okay, this is an American document. Go and search American date formats and that will tell you what's the most likely interpretation for those numbers that you're looking at. Like I say, it's gonna vary from place to place. Yes? Well, in, in most of the genealogy programs, they use the first three letters of the month. That's very common. Um, because when you get into November and December, it gets quite long. So that's why, but thank you for asking me that. I was afraid you found a typo. I was showing Melina earlier and she found a couple of typos that I had missed last time around. Step three is assessing the information and the sources that you have. Do you understand what I mean by assess and evaluate? Do you, do you ever assess and evaluate in, uh, in your work? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's thinking about how accurate something is, how true it is, whether it's worthwhile keeping, um, one of the considerations in family history research is do you think that the person that made the record actually had the right information? So I mentioned earlier, say a birth certificate for a person. The birth certificate is filled in by the mom and dad generally immediately after the birth. So the information about the person's name and their birth date and birthplace is usually very accurate. Go down to the other end of somebody's life to a death certificate. Do you know who fills in most death certificates? Their sons, their daughters? Exactly. Sometimes even grandchildren. How, how accurate do you think grandchildren are in general? about the birth date and birthplace of their grandparents. Not very. Yeah. A little bit shaky. And sometimes they just don't have the level of detail. So, um, you know, if, um, let's say, um, one, of, one of your soldiers was actually born in Carleton Place, maybe his grandchildren filling in a death certificate or writing an obituary might say he was from Ottawa. You can see that in, in, in one of the examples I'm going to show you later. Um, a cousin of mine was from this tiny little place that you know doesn't even have any stores. It's called a townland in Ireland. But when he filled in his attestation paper, he said he was from Bantry, which is the nearest town, not even a city. There's only three cities in Ireland. It's hard to find them. So quite often people will will say their entire lives that they're from Ottawa when really they're from Nepean or Fallowfield or Munster. So if you're coming at the document that says Ottawa, keep an open mind. Maybe it's not Ottawa. Maybe one day you'll find something more specific. Uh, double check everything. 
Don't be surprised to find more than one birth date. Don't be surprised if somebody's lied. Now, you might find soldiers that lied about their age to enlist in the army, but I'm going to take you back to Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank, I don't know how well you can see that. I use the yellow highlighter in the onesie, and uh, the, on some screens it just obscures the information. But Uncle Frank said he was 21, and Annie said she was 16. A little young, but it was the, what was it? the early 1920s, I think, things happened. Well, I went and did a little bit more research. I, I knew when Uncle Frank was born. I knew him my entire life. He wasn't 21. In fact, he was, let me see here, yeah, 18. And then I went and did some research on this Annie Davy. Would you believe she was 13 years old? Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know where their parents were. <laughs> But why did they lie? Well, it's not about um, why they lie, but um, aren't you allowed to like, like go into the army when you're 18? Um, you, you might want to do some research to see what the minimum age was for enlistment. I think it was 18, but I'm not sure. I'm was. sure Ms. Moore would know. Yeah, it was 18. 18. So I bet there were a lot of 17-year-olds, and maybe some 16-year-olds. Move your head. I know one, one of my uncles-in-law lied to get into the it's army. Right. It's right. Yes. Uh, I read a book where John Chris or something. Uh, he was 10 when he went to war. 10. Well, in, in some countries today, you'll find child soldiers at, I, at 17 claiming to be 18 is one thing. 10, 11, 12 and holding a rifle is, is quite another. Um, but I'm not going to go down that road. But I mean, you'll, you'll certainly get a picture in doing your research how much life has changed since the time of the Great War. How people were doing things at the age of 16, 17, and 18 that, that we wouldn't think of today. What's next? Uh, back to assessing the information. Another thing to think about is whether um, you have any unclear information. Uh, maybe you can't make up the handwriting. Um, information that doesn't agree with each other. So maybe you need to find another source that's a strong, likely source that will clarify things. Um, what's missing? You know, what do you not know yet about your soldier? And that's when you start to make a research plan. I'm going to hand out a research plan for you. Uh, let me see. How is this okay. done? Okay, it's it's two pages each one. I think it's front oh. and back. Oh, is it front and back? Okay. Yeah, it's front and back. Okay. All right. So you I just need to could. take one one sheet each. And I'll pull mine out. Turn off. You just push that big button up there. Push that big button. Research plan for my World War One um, relative. His name is Daniel Joseph Moynihan, and he came to Alberta from Ireland in, um, a long time ago. The first thing I found out about Daniel Joseph was his attestation paper. So I was imagining going back to when all I had was the attestation paper. A research plan asks you, what do I want to know? And you just have to scribble it in. It's nothing fancy. Well, I want to know when he was born. Is the date he gave me on the attestation paper right or did he lie? Did he survive the war? 
did he marry and have children? And then I have the next session, section, what I already know. Well, I know from the attestation paper that he, was, he said he was born the 1st of June, 1888, in Bantry, uh, Cork, Ireland, and that he was a school teacher. So that's all I know about him. So then I, set, I, I break down some tasks. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to confirm his birth date. And I try to think of where could I go? What do you think I could look for to confirm a birth date? A birth certificate, exactly. Or in Ireland, the birth registration. And the next thing is, where would I find that? What's the location of that source? Do you know where I'd find an Irish birth certificate? Uh, maybe you could search it on the internet? Exactly. And um, there are some sites listed in your handout. And I'm going to give you yet another one that focuses on Ontario where you can look at at least the indexes of Irish birth registrations. Another place to look is the baptismal record. Maybe if I can find the parish records from Bantry, I can look and see if I can find them. Secondly, did he survive the war? Any idea where I would look to find out if he survived the war? Uh, Ancestry.ca maybe? Yeah, and do you know which particular database there might be that would help with that? Uh, maybe one for soldiers? Yes, and there are several. Uh, Did you have a suggestion? Look at our um, death certificate to see if like, they died like, during the time of the war. That's a possibility as well. Now, because they were fighting overseas, you might have to look for a death certificate in France, and I don't even know if the French government was in a position to provide death certificates. But Ancestry does have a list of casualties, and I think the Library and Archives Canada site also has it, probably for free, that will tell you um, a little more about who, was, um, who, who died and was buried where. There's also the Commonwealth Graves, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which is a great online site, and it's a place where if you find more information about your soldier, if, if the soldier died during the war, you can put information up to create a memorial. You can put a picture if you've got one. So that's a very simple plan. What do I want to know? And what do I already know? What do I have to figure out? Where am I going to find it? And then once you found it, you just put a check mark in that last column. It's, it's pretty simple. And we're going to work through something like that. Now, um, I'd like to pass out another document. Now, the top of this got cut off. It's Ontario Genealogy thank you again, Record Sources. And in this case, what I've tried to do is do a little bit of research. And th this is... I did this in about an afternoon, so this is not a definitive uh, uh, piece of research. If you find new things, please go in and add them. But I've tried to give you some physical and some online sources of information about people that might have been in World War I. So at the top, we've got vital records. Does anybody know what vital records are? Yes. Uh, so, something some essential oh, records like the birth and death certificate. Exactly. Birth, marriage, and death certificates are often called vital records. Then we've got church records. So there you might find baptismal records and marriage records. Military service records, census records, burial records, immigration and travel records, and family trees. And this is just a whole bunch of places where you can go for information. Ancestry has an awful lot of information, but so does Family Search, which is a free site. So feel free when you're at home and, and uh, working on your project to go to Family Search and see what you can find. There are um, a number of things there, like some of the early Ontario births. Um, and uh, 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 births, deaths, and they've got some baptisms as well. 
But I have to tell you, you're going to run into a little bit of a wall here on the vital records. Because of privacy considerations, I can't get your birth certificate online. You can't get mine. As old as I look, you can't get mine. All you'll be able to find online is births from 1869, when the record keeping started, to 1912. You'll find marriages up until 1927. So that's about 10 years after the war. You might find a lot of your soldiers in there. And then death up to 1937. So if your soldier survived 20 years after the war, you won't be able to find the death certificate. But head down to burial records and get some ideas for other places where you can look. There are a number of services right now where volunteers are going out to cemeteries and snapping pictures. One called Billion Graves has an iPhone app where it uses the GPS on your phone to, um, to tell exactly where this headstone is. And it snaps the picture of it. That goes into a list and somebody else logs into Billion Graves and they say, Okay, what needs to be transcribed? Oh, look, Leanne's just been to the cemetery and she's put in 10 pictures. Well, I'm going to call up those pictures and I'm going to transcribe those records. Joe Blow, John Smith, and write down all the information so that the next person that comes along that goes into Billion Graves will be able to see the headstone picture and the information that was on it and they'll be able to run a search to find John Smith or William Bate. Um, that's not the only one. Find a Grave is uh, quite good and has quite a lot of Ontario records. Uh, there are a couple of others as well, and um, I, I know your, your chances are, are not too bad of, uh, of finding one of your soldiers that way. Uh, let me see. Think about family trees as well. Now, somebody might have already researched your soldier, and you might find that on Ancestry. But you might also find um, something on paper, um, uh, maybe a family uh, history book that was written by somebody else on your family. Uh, where is it here? Up, up in the church records um, um, box. I've got the names of a couple of the genealogical societies. Uh, uh, have I got any? Yeah, these are all genealogical societies, but there are also historical societies in the local area that hang on to stuff like family histories that were done of a prominent family in the area. So um, quite often you can go onto their website and find a catalog of what information they have if you go to their office. So have a look. Uh, I know that uh, um, I didn't see anything when I was trying to do Lena's project for my own amusement. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you may find your families there. So have a look at those. Now what have we got next? Use the research plan to organize yourself. Um, in your handout, you'll also find a link to this document, which is a checklist of information sources. So it's something to get you thinking about what could I be looking for. Like I say, you'll be able to go to the handout online and click on the link and it'll take you to this. Oh, and there's a research plan that I've already talked about. Number five. This is where we finally get to the research. <laughs> It's about time, eh? So there's three, three main um, ways of researching that I want to suggest to you. Interviewing, going to archives, like actually walking into a building, and searching online. So have I got interviews. Now, if you look at your handout, on page four, there are some questions that you might want to use when you're interviewing relatives about your family tree. Use a video or voice recorder and take notes. Have your list of questions ahead of time, like, you know, what did grandma study when she was at school? What kind of games did she play with grandpa in the military? 
Um, ask them to have a look at the information you've already collected about your family. Or, if, for example, if you found a descendant of your soldier, ask them to look at what you have. They may be able to correct mistakes or add to the information that you have. Visit archives. Now, you've got to do some homework. So start, start with this. Go to the links that I've given you and find out what is where. So let's say you're looking for the casualty records. Well, you'll search and you'll find those ones are online. But if you want the military file of your particular soldier, I don't think you're going to find it online. You're going to go, have to go to library and archives downtown, which is this building down on Wellington, um, just down from the Parliament buildings. But to be able to go there and research, you need to have um, a reader's or researcher's card. And you have to apply online a couple of days early and then go pick it up. And then you have to request the file that you want and give them time to pull it out of probably the basement of another building and bring it to you. So you can't just decide one Saturday morning you're going to go and get the record. Um, genealogy often takes more time than that. Uh, just I have to say though, just going to library and archives and walking around the stacks in the library is fascinating. There are written genealogies, family histories, of some families, in, uh, Canadian families there. There are also a lot of city directories. Do you guys remember phone books? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They and still have phone them. Books, they're harder and harder to find, but before there were even phones, there were city directories. And they're fascinating. Because while, the, while the, the phone book might just give my name, maybe my address, and my phone number, the city directory would also say what kind of work I did. So in between censuses, it's a great way to find out who was working where. You might get their, the name of their company. Um, you'll also find little tidbits like how soon did they get a telephone, which is kind of fascinating, especially, you know, I, I had very poor ancestors that immigrated to Canada. And so to see them getting a phone is a sign of real achievement. Uh, and settlement here in Canada. Search online as well. Uh, and like I said, uh, there are a lot of links uh, that I've given you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so peruse the links. Have a look and see what you can find online. Not everything is on Ancestry. Not everything costs money. <laughs> Oh, yeah. one other thing about Somebody. ancestry. Did you guys Star Wars? Did you guys know that if you go to oh. the <laughs> did, did you know that if you go to the main branch or the center point branch of the library you can access ancestry for free? Also, um, the uh, the Church of Latter day Saints has done a lot of genealogical research and they have a family history center on Prince of Wales that's open um, a few hours a day through the week. And you can use their computers to access um, programs like Find My Past and uh, Ancestry and Family Search and others. You can also access a vast catalog of microfilm, a lot of which relates to this local area. So that, that's an, another free um, um, uh, archive that, that you guys can access and easily access. Oh, I have to say, not everything is online. Or as the lady in the walker is saying, Great Uncle Bertrand didn't have a computer in 1880, so how will you find them online? It's a joke. Not everything is there. Like I said, the soldier's files uh, typically aren't available online, uh, but if you request them, then they get then they get digitized. My husband was very lucky. He was looking for his grandfather's Australian World War One service, and he went to the website to find out how to order the file, and found that it was already there, thirty some pages of his record, and it was it was just one of the best days of his life to find that. It's, you know, I said you're like a detective on a treasure hunt. Um, when you find one of these gems, it's really exciting. Keep track of where you've already looked and what you've looked for. 
so you don't waste time repeating unproductive searches. So if you looked for bait and didn't find anything, check for baits and write down that you searched bait and baits and still didn't find anything. Things like that. The fifth step here, as, as I um, alluded to earlier, once you find a little bit of information, you discover new questions and you end up needing a new research plan to start all over again. Because you've never quite finished it. Nobody has ever said everyone in the family tree has been found, everything's organized, including the photos. Ever, 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 has, never has it been said. So a couple of tips before I finish up. Collect the facts, but don't forget the story behind them. That's how you get to know your ancestors. I'm 47 years old, and I just found out a couple of months ago that my mom used to work at a soda fountain, making banana splits and shakes and stuff. I thought she was kind of boring, but that's a really cool job. Does that mean you be able to make yeah. Well, and that she's a professional, so she could make me a banana split today. Use timelines to sort out puzzles. Any idea what a timeline would be in the genealogical context? Basically like a number line, except uh, with dates. Exactly. And I've sure, got one you. for you. And the project that we're going to do, the exercise we're going to do afterwards, is to fill in a timeline. So the, the idea here in the timeline is that you're keeping track of the events in someone's life. And you're going to give the date, but also the age the person was at that date. Uh, at that date. So let's say they got married in a certain year, they were 21. They enlisted in the army at a certain date, they were 19. You're going to want to write down where the event took place. The description is for any extra information, like what battalion they were in, for example. And then your information source. The information source, like I said before, is always there to remind you of whether this is good information or mm -mm information. Now, everybody got the two-sided one? On the back of the handout, I put a little checklist there for you to remember. What kinds of things would you want to look for in filling out someone's timeline? And I, I think that that's quite similar to the information sheet that Mr. Moore has given you. Before I leave talking about timelines, I have to add something else. Are we just interested in what's happening in this person's life? No. 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 Do you know what else? Not. Do you know what else we might want to put on there? Their children's, their parents. Exactly. And maybe, like yes, some of their, like maybe like an army general or something. Could like be. the person who was leading them. Yeah. Army. Yeah, certainly, um, do, including their family, tells you things like, well, his father died when he was 15. No wonder he went to work when he was 16. You know, you start to understand people better. What else might we add? Any ideas? How about what else is going on in the world or in the local area? So for, uh, for my soldier, I was looking at when war broke out versus when he enlisted. So was he one of the early enlisters or did he wait? That tells me a little something. Um, you can look at things like when the war ended, um, when, um, when there was a particular natural disaster. You know, if there was a major fire in Hull in a particular year. You want to find out, was, was, was my person in Hull then? Could they have lost their house? Ask yourself questions like that. And um, there, are, there are places that you can go. Let's see, I wrote down one of them here.
CanadianHistory.com. Um, the Canadian War Museum has um, a site 